Thank you for checking out our YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe and like. And please visit us at barrykibrick.com where you'll see all the ways that you can become a patron of our mission and help us continue to build a community of seekers who quest for knowledge, information, and most importantly, wisdom. What does it really mean when people say act your age? It just may not be what you think. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick and my guest Christopher Phillips, the renowned Socratic scholar, has an answer to that age-old question. With his book, A Child at Heart, he unlocks our creativity, curiosity, and reason so that we can feel fulfilled at every age and stage of our lives. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. And Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is also made possible by the following contributors. A complete list of funders is available at barrykibrick.com. Chris, it is a pleasure to see you again. You told me it's been seven years. I can't believe that. But the first time we met was when I had you on for Socrates Cafe. We're going to get into that, but I first want to welcome you back to the show. It's wonderful to be back, Barry. And that's, I feel like you're my Plato to the Socrates. Oh, well, I feel like you're my Plato to my Socrates, so don't <laughs> worry about that. Uh, you know, I have to say something else. As the viewers know by now, I read every part of the book but never did I see my own name and my wife's in one. So you actually put us in your acknowledgments and I just wanted to mm -hmm. share that with my viewers and to tell you mm -hmm. how honored I am. Oh, I was so honored that you've been interested in my work for such a long time. And as the saying goes, if, if you see a turtle on a fence post, as my friend Alex Haley said, he didn't get there by himself, and you really have helped me all along in the course of my career. Well, Never forget that. Well, you, you help so many people, and let's start with Socrates Cafe. Okay. So the viewers who may not have been familiar with it mm -hmm. when we introduced it, tell them what it is, because this book is using the same exact process that mm -hmm. you do in a Socrates Cafe, right. but this time to get out how we at any age can mm -hmm. be enriched by anyone from mm -hmm. any age. So A Child at Heart really was the first one that was unanticipated. It was an unexpected birthing. And the idea was that we all need to have either children in our orbit or we need to have people who are childlike in our orbit if we're going to continue growing and expanding our horizons at every age and stage of life. Even when we're quite frail and infirm, we want to quite often keep asking, why, why, why? But it gets harder and harder to find people who want to keep inquiring with us. So I try to offer sort of a path and a roadmap to those who want to continue taking transformative steps at every age and stage. Well, you say, in fact, that the children, we, we really need to philosophize with them because no one questions or mm -hmm. wonders. And as the proud grandparent of two, mm -hmm. I can tell you, and it's not just, remember that old, that mm -hmm. old show, ch children say, the kids say the darndest things. Right. It's not that they say the darndest things, mm -hmm. it's that if you pay attention, and this is what you do throughout mm -hmm. the book, they can be saying and doing mm -hmm. the wisest things. That's exactly right. And I have two children's books, The Philosopher's Club and, and Day of Why. And in many ways, this is an outgrowth of that because I, I realized that I was learning much more from young people than they could ever learn from me. And I just became, even though I have all these degrees and diplomas, I became Chris, the inquirer and thinker. And, and I also started to ask myself, how can we sort of confront life's slings and arrows? and not just overcome them and surmount them, but absorb them in ways that enable us to continue a joyful life, an ecstatic life, even in rather harrowing moments. And 
we can look to young people in many ways as our models for so many things. It takes a special kind of adult to understand that it's not, a lot of adults say, oh, it's, it's not easy being a parent. Well, it's not easy being a child either. I mean, it's not for the faint of heart. And they have an empathy, a capacity to use language, not just in playful ways, but in ways that can lead us down new portals if we would just open ourselves up a little bit more. But Chris, what's so ironic, and you stated clearly in the book, is even though we are learning all of this from our children and our children are, are so much a part of our lives, you say these words, never before has our culture been as child-centric mm -hmm. as it is today, and yet never before has childhood been as strained and pinched as it is today. Mm -hmm. So we uh, helicopter parents, we over-scheduling adults, have not afforded kids the time to keep cultivating that innate sense of wonder that virtually all of us enter the world and have. So I try to ask myself, why is it that so many of us lose those qualities, lose those capacities as time goes by? How is it? There's these stage theories of life that assume that there's this constant ascent, but I would argue that more often than not, there, we shrivel, we, sh we shrink like raisins, as one child said in a dialogue, rather than continue to grow and change. We become, or, or we become like stone, as Sartre would say. How is it that that innate, inherent capacity to keep asking why, why, why gets shunted off in the hurly-burly of everyday living? Is it necessary? Is it something that's almost a natural outcome? Or is, or is it the way that we're being in the world, and can we change it at any time? My argument is that not only can we change it and continue to cultivate those capacities, but we must, not just for ourselves and for personal growth, but for societal growth. Society is a kind of self. We don't just do it for ourselves, we do it for our ancestors, those who didn't have the opportunities we had, and we do, we do it for those to come with a sense of vision. So not just one generation from now, but think in terms of 500 generations from now. Where are we in this world and what kind of world do we want to leave behind? And also what we don't realize is the capacity we have as we age, if we keep our minds flexible and elastic, yes. and, and it's not only mm -hmm. just interacting with children, by the way, to right. do that, you can interact with adults who are flexible and elastic, yes. but we must, because if we don't keep ourselves elastic, we're dead the minute we stop asking why, in my, in, in yes. my humble opinion. Once we stop asking why, mm -hmm. That's our purpose. Our purpose outside of procreation mm -hmm. and survival mm -hmm. is to question. Well, you know, we should be openists. We should strive constantly to challenge ourselves and to question our perspectives. And we have to do that by inquiring with thoughtful others. Where A Child at Heart, in many ways, takes a different route from my earlier four books is that I bring in a lot of the latest studies from neuroscience, from the cognitive sciences, and I show that there's absolutely no reason why our wiring has to get hardened over time. We can maintain that elasticity if we continue living a certain kind of creative life. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to have to dramatically change our draw, job or leave our relationship. It just means that we should open up our lenses to new dimensions and possibilities. We should take a moment to, to write a poem or put down a thought or, or maybe to learn a new instrument or learn a new language. All of these things contribute to having a keener sense of who you are, a keener sense of, uh, of well-being, and it also leads us maybe down new paths that we otherwise wouldn't have anticipated. And it's very, it's only one line, but you, uh, it caught my attention because I believe it so much. There's also a physical attribute to thinking. And if you don't keep yourself mm -hmm. in physical condition, and mm -hmm. by that it doesn't mean that you have to mm -hmm. look like a, a bodybuilder or be the greatest yoga person mm -hmm. or whatever the case might be, but your physical condition does affect your emotional and mental state. You put it only in one line to make sure you exercise, eat healthy, and mm -hmm. stay. But it's true. If we want to maintain that mm -hmm. elasticity and mm -hmm. keep questioning, we also have to be concerned that we take care right. of ourselves. But to be concerned, we have to feel like we're living a life that's worthwhile. 
But why take care of ourselves if we don't feel like we're living our mortal moment in a way that's not just saying I was here, but that whenever our time is up, that we're living in a way that we have touched other lives in ways that hopefully have made it more possible and probable for others to discover and develop and contribute their talents. And if we only want the best for our own children, I became a dad late, I have a five-year-old and a 12-year-old, but if we don't want what's best for children on the other side of the world, whether we ever meet them or not, and for children in, in times to come, then I think we're doing a disservice to our own children. This, this notion that uh, social conscience can, you know, begins and ends in our community, our society, I think is very narrow. Uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is that very destitute children, for instance, in Mumbai, India, where, where we have flourishing Socrates cafes, they have this innate sense of empathy. They want to be their brother, sister, and sister's keeper. But they don't have the means or, or resources or ability. But it's innate within them. And so what we should do, at least part of our time in our lives, is create those fertile conditions that make it more and more possible for our fellow brothers and sisters to help others when they want to, to not feel a sense of impotence or resignation. And let's be selfish about it, to help ourselves. We so don't know. It all. My, my guest, yes. Rod Powell, who you met, who came on before, he said, we don't know what Einstein might be sitting in Mumbai. That's you exactly know what? right. Or, you know, we don't know that because we, they don't have mm -hmm. the ability to to discover that so many mm -hmm. other people have. That's so exactly right. we really, if I say be selfish, I mean, I know, well, I really think if you're selfish in the mm -hmm. most purest, best way of being selfish, you're the most unselfish person on the planet. There's this false notion that selfishness and selflessness are at opposite ends of a continuum, and I think nothing could be further from the truth. I think they're inextricably entwined. I started Socrates Cafe in 1996 because I felt like I was too much like Stone, that I really wasn't listening to other people. I really didn't want to hear them out. So it was something that has enabled me to continue growing and flourishing and to want to start taking care of myself better because I was having these inquiries and bridging chasms between one human soul and another. And I find also that if you don't make that commitment to yourself, I'm going through a crisis right now and it's challenging. It's not a crisis. I want to say it's, it's challenging, but it, it's refreshing and it's scary. In other words, we're allowed to hold all these thoughts mm -hmm. in us at the same time. This is another thing that a child at mm -hmm. heart teaches very well is, you know, you can be scared, but you can be wise. Yes. You can be a, a, a timid, but you can yeah. be strong. There's so many levels yes. of personalities and you see them in children sometimes better than anywhere else. That's why I think you really mm -hmm. wanted to bring this book out. Mm -hmm. Not that it doesn't exist in, and should right. exist at all ages, but mm -hmm. you can see it. In well, the know, children. Barry, many of the reasons that I decided to write this book sprang from a personal tragedy in my life, the very tragic death of my father. And I had to ask myself a lot of hard and painful questions. But you can almost embrace your sorrow and grief in a very narcissistic way. And then I, I talk in my book about how Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, exalts what he calls the child spirit. The, what he thinks is the highest possible human spirit, that it's sort of an eternal yes, that no matter what slings and arrows bef befall you if, you, if you're still alive and you're still kicking, that you will absorb it and that you will set new examples for others. And, and the example I offer in my book is Mal Malala Yousafzai, who won the Nobel Prize, that child who was shot by the Taliban. And not only did she not feel any anger or resentment, what she ultimately wanted was for the Taliban and for their children to be able to become better educated. She wanted for them what she wanted for herself, for a woman, a young child who's female, to have the right to become educated. Her absence of bitterness in circumstances in which most people would have felt great pity for themselves made me look in the mirror and ask myself a lot of hard questions, but ultimately to channel all of that mixture of grief and passion and anger also into joy and ecstasy in ways that, uh, but she was my 
people like her are my role models in these things. They're so resilient, and I had to learn to, to practice that myself. You know, you mentioned Nietzsche, and the funny thing is, is I didn't, I didn't, as I told you before, I'm not mentioning them, but you, you used the fact that there is so much neurological science now that proves these things. Mm -hmm. But what's really great is when you read all about the things you write about Socrates and Cicero and mm -hmm. Plato and Aristotle and John Mill and John Locke. I want them to know that mm -hmm. all of these philosophers are in there mm -hmm. and they preceded this wisdom before you even needed the neurological study. So the right. research does back it up. It really but the does. truth is, we as humans have the capacity mm -hmm. to know this. They knew mm -hmm. it. And by the way, they're the famous people that knew it. Mm -hmm. I always say that if you've got one, one famous person that knows it, there's about 10 or 15 others that no one knows about that knows it as well. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of blessed in this human spirit of ourselves that we, we are philosophers mm -hmm. and yeah. we must maintain that thought because once you lose from that philosophical point of view, you are now operating on, in my opinion, levels that are literally made up. They are not the, mm -hmm. the issues that are embedded in mm -hmm. our consciousness. And if we don't operate out of those, mm -hmm. the world will not benefit. Well, I think the capacity for philosophical inquiry and observation where we sort of wed together reason and imagination in ways that might enable us to frame questions in different ways that might lead to a new whole host of answers has always been the philosophical enterprise. The philosophers that I introduce or bring in my book like Heidegger, Hannah Arendt, and uh, Hume and Berkeley, they all inquired at some time with kids. And all that writing on their part has typically gotten short shrift in the philosophical canon, even though they themselves are well known. So I try to bring in that thought because their anecdotal observations of children have now been confirmed by the latest neuroscience and the latest cognitive science studies that kids have not just this innate capacity to wonder, but they have a, this, they don't see the world in a blurry way. They get really, it's not fair they're dis for that. They see holistically. So when we do break down, things down into categories as adults are prone to do, let's put it back together again like a kid would and we'll see new horizons and new vistas because we'll have created a new type of mountain. Well, in fact, you even give us a warning that as adults, when we don't do this, mm -hmm. we are losing so much of our own power. You, I, I, I had to write this down in bold letters. I said, the workplace, and I'm gonna read your words now. Then, as now, most adults hope for their shot at an idyllic adulthood, even as they continue to be treated like children in a demeaning sense. And I wrote down the workplace. How mm -hmm. many of us as adults mm -hmm. are being treated like children? Mm -hmm. I see it so much. In, mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm speechless so much. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed at how so many, especially at the middle management right. level, will treat adults right. in such an improper way. And conversely, when an adult be, has a fit or a tantrum or is, is, is behaving in a very petulant way, we claim that they're behaving childishly or in an infantile way. Right. And I would argue that that is the greatest insult you can possibly give for a child. And most children actually are quite empathic with one another. They, they don't behave that way naturally. So let's quit giving kids a bad name and when an adult behaves horribly, let's quit saying that they're childish. When an adult spins beyond his means, Quit saying that that's some infantile capacity. Infants don't behave that way. That, again, cognitive studies show that infants are these bundles of empathy. One of my favorite studies was when these cognitive sciences threw a, bu a bunch of keys beyond, uh, behind some pillows. A baby will risk life and limb to rescue those keys and bring them back to the adult. 
that's, that's an empathic capacity. And so again, the question is, why do we lose that over time? Why do we adults go on Twitter and hurl insults at one another that a child will get punished for? We don't have to be this way, but we do need to go back and hark back to kids and keep them in our orbit and not just be cognizant of the examples that we can set for them, but of how they can set examples for us. And even if we haven't, you give us the hope we might have more than one peak point, or more likely, a variety of peak points at different junctures in our life. So, even if, I love this part, we could almost erase the past. I don't wanna, that, that, uh, I wanna be careful how I say that. You cannot erase the past, but you don't have to judge the future by your past. So if you feel that you're in a rut mm -hmm. at any age, at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, yes. or 10, whatever the age may be, right. you got to know that you may reach another peak. You just have to keep that questioning going, keep that mm -hmm. why question pondering in your mind, keep all of that going, and we could peak quite often in life. Sometimes I feel like we can do it, peak several times in the same day you know, the ups and downs of, of a quotidian day that we can have that capacity sometimes. And I, I do feel that we can, we should see ourselves as sculptures in the making. Our actions today can completely remake our past. One of the more extreme examples I give in the book is the Ku Klux Klan member who had beaten now Congressman John Lewis. And they had a, they reunited. John Lewis completely forgave him. He allowed this person to be the person that he was today to lead to that act of forgiveness. So no matter, rather than letting go of our past or forgetting our past, embrace it and channel it in ways that create a new moment now. When you become more forgiving, more open, more understanding, more creative, then Whatever your past has been, it's nonetheless led up to this moment. The question is, how many of us take advantage of that opportunity? Very, very few do. But the fact that there are iconic examples is enough for me to have felt in, in my latter 30s when I started Socrates Cafe, to have said as, as that poem, in, this Rilke poem, the last line says, you must change your life. And so I think we must heed that and quit making lots of excuses and rationales for not doing so. And we do it for the generations to come and the generations that came before us. I had so many poor Greek relatives who didn't have the opportunities I did. So if I just say, oh, I'm not gonna do X, Y, and Z because I'm this age or because I had this experience, then I think it denigrates those who came before me. One of the ways you believe strongly in that we can keep this going is, as you say, plays the thing. It is our core nature mm -hmm. to play. How many of us forget that? I mean, watch kids. They'll play a simple game of tag, right? And then they'll all almost in quantum fashion change the rules and change the kind of tag. And they all almost reach this immediate agreement. I've, I've seen it so many times. And it's fascinating to me that things are more fluid with them. And we never have to lose that fluid capacity to change the rules of the game. I think that we're still going to discover, as much as we want fixed rules in the universe, I think we live in a playful universe. And I think we're going to find that um, we can't put it all, cubby hole it all. It, we're, I think we're still in the dark ages of what the universe is really all about. There's, uni there's dimensions that we have not yet even created the instruments for to discover. And I think kids, if we could populate our offices and our research centers with kids, I'm not being facetious, I think they would help us learn to ask and frame questions, us older folks, in ways that would lead to new physical discoveries and cosmological discoveries. By the way, Chris, you almost answered your own question right in your book when you say dialogue at its best was a form of play, a dance, a marathon of questions and answers. We have this dialogue, and I am so grateful that you share it with us. Oh, thank you so much, Barry.
It's my pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And I hope you come back again with your next book, all right? I'm giving birth to it right now. All right. I love it. And thank you for joining us. To listen to my podcast, which has additional content that we didn't have time for on our broadcast, just search for Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick on your favorite podcast provider. And to comment or ask me any questions about our show, visit our website at barrykibrick.com. And you can also email me at barry at barrykibrick.com, and I promise to personally respond. But before we go, I'd like to leave you with these few more words by Chris Phillips. The important resolution you must make is to be resolved, come what may, to keep moving forward and upward despite moments of despair, dread, and setback. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between despair and setback, resides the answers you need. Keep your mind and heart open. Take a few deep breaths and you will move forward and upward. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. My pleasure, buddy. To become part of the Between the Lines family, go to barrykibrick.com. There you can join our book club, participate in Q&As, catch past episodes, Listen to Barry's podcasts, read his blog, and experience exclusive online features, all at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. And Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is also made possible by the following contributors. A complete list of funders is available at barrykibrick.com. <laughs>